So yes, so today we are going to be looking at just two things. Um, we're going to be looking at Safari extensions, which I think we've looked at in the past before, but not in that much depth. And then we're also going to look at uh, Mac shortcuts, um, which um, I'll go into more detail about. Um, so Safari extensions, they've been around for quite a few years now actually, but they've only really kind of become a serious thing in the last couple of years um, because Apple has finally kind of given them a proper place on the App Store. So what an extension is, is like a small app that um, works only inside the Safari browser. Um, so let me just share my screen again. Okay. So hopefully you can see this. Can, can you see it, guys? Yes, we can. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so it's basically, yeah, the, the Safari extensions are tiny little apps which work just inside the web browser. Um, one of the new developments is that they now synchronize across your devices. So you can actually use extensions on your phone as well now, which you couldn't do until quite recently. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through through a few of my favorite um, extensions and then I'll show you how to find them because they're not always that easy to kind of find and to to see what what's possible. Um, so the first one I'm going to show you guys is Adblock, which is probably the most uh, downloaded extension of all and it's used by lots and lots of people um, and it just does one thing really, really well and it literally does what it says, it blocks ads. Um, so if I go to my Safari and visit a website, so I'm trying to think of a website that has lots of adverts, let's try Yahoo. Good old dead Yahoo. <laughs> so, if I go to, where are you, Adblock? Oops. Safari preferences, ads. So, yeah, Adblock Plus, it's literally just um, an on or off button. And what it does is it will um, block adverts. So when you visit a web page, instead of seeing an advert, you'll see a white box and it will just tell you that an advert should have been there. Um, and that's an advantage for a few reasons. Firstly, a lot of web adverts can actually track your behavior and track what you're doing. And they have something embedded in them called a pixel, which allows the, the marketing company to know who's clicking on it, where they are, what websites they're going to after that website and all, all kinds of things that you might not want people to know about. The second benefit is that a lot of adverts use a lot of resources on your computer. They tend to be loading stuff in the background. They sometimes have videos. They quite often have annoying audio as well, which just pops up and you can't turn off. Um, so blocking adverts is um, very useful and it can actually save a lot of battery life on a laptop, for example. Um, this one is completely free. Um, most extensions are free. Some extensions have paid elements, um, but this one's completely free. So if I install it on this um, Safari browser, I'll show you the process. It's really simple. They're all now stored within the App Store itself. They used to be third party things, but now they're on the App Store. So I just install it like I would any other app. And of course, I need to sign in. See if I remember my password. And if you have any questions as I'm talking, please just type them into the chat window or let Mark know. And Mark, if I miss anything, if you can um, provoke me, that would be <laughs> good. Um, so I've opened that now. So when you install an extension, 
it ends up in the Safari preferences. Um, and there's a section called extensions. And on the left, left will be the list of all the extensions you've got installed. And so you can tick and untick them whenever you want to. Um, so now when I visit a web page, so if I go to, um, uh, I'm trying to think of a commercial website. So, anyone got any suggestions of a website with lots of adverts on it? <laughs> Mailonline.com. Oh, sorry? Mail online, the daily oh, mail. <laughs> How could I forget? So there should be some spaces where there would have been adverts. Where, are, where would the adverts normally be on this page? I think it's doing a good job. So we click on it up here. See, it's just got one option, off or on. And it does seem to be doing the job. There's no adverts. It also makes pages load a bit faster because most websites will prioritize the adverts first for loading because um, that's how they make their money. Um, so it has multiple benefits, really. But yeah, not, not one advert so far. So that's just, yeah, that's that. That's, it's a pretty straightforward one. Not the most exciting one in the world, but actually I think most people end up glad that they've installed it. Um, there's a lot of negative reviews, um, but when you read through them, it's mostly because people aren't really understanding what it is or what it's for, and they think it should be doing more than it, it says it should. Um, I think also a lot of people don't understand that, of course, advertisers are constantly trying to catch up with the technology and overcome it. So every time one of these extensions learns how to block a new type of ad, then the marketers at, at ad companies will find another way around it. So you might occasionally have times when it doesn't block an ad, but they're usually quite quick to, to catch on. Um, but it's not by no means the, the only one. There's loads of different ad blockers. It's just Adblock Plus was the first and it's been around the longest. So I think it probably has the most ability to block the most things. Um, so that's the first one. The second one's Honey. Honey's a really interesting one. Um, so I talked about how things track you on the internet when you're, when you're looking at adverts and things. And the way Honey works is Honey is a system which you can sign up for for free, which um, shows you discounts when you're shopping online. Um, so for example, I've already got it installed. So if I go to Curry's, and in a second, there's a red number up here on top of my Honey logo, and that's telling me that it's found 23 vouchers that could be used on this website. So there's £10 off a of TV. Here we've got £30 off of something. I'm not sure what that is. Off of cookers. So basically, whenever you visit a website to buy something, it will try and search the web looking for vouchers that you can use for that website. So it is pretty useful, and it's really useful on... on general websites like John Lewis and, and department stores and that kind of thing. Then the other thing that they do is, if, and this part's optional, is you can activate um, rewards. And the way rewards works is by allowing them to track your shopping habits, they share the ad revenue with you that they would get. So you get money back from just shopping with that turned on. Um, so on all the websites that where there's adverts and things, you would get a percentage um, by sharing your behavior. So most places take your behavior, your data behavior, behavior data without your knowledge anyway. So this is kind of a way of at least cashing in on it a little. Um, how much money you end up making, I'm not sure. I've not actually tried it myself, but that's just another feature that you don't have to use that feature. You can just use it just for the coupons. Um, and it would just basically, you click on a coupon and it copies it to your um, clipboard and then you just paste it into the checkout at the end. And it works on, on most international websites. So if I go on John Lewis, and it should in a second come up with a little number. Yeah, 
he says. Let's look for something like a Dyson. Oh, no, no numbers on John Lewis. Um, let's try a clothes shop. Oh, there's one, one little voucher. 10, 10 pounds, 10% 10 off. So yeah, it's another one which is not, it's not a huge deal, but for people who shop online a lot, you can save quite a lot of money, um, especially if you're going to buy the thing anyway. It's always worth checking to see if there's a voucher for it, and that just makes it a little bit quicker. Um, actually, before I go to the next one, I'm going to show you how to find where you can see all of the extensions, because it's not super obvious on the App Store um, where they are. So when you open the App Store on your Mac, um, you actually have to go to Categories on the left, and then within um, the categories, you've got the Safari extensions category. And then that will just show you the top free ones and then the top paid ones. And then Apple have created some kind of uh, selections. So at the top here, you've got their, their favorite ones, um, which a few of them I'm going to show you. And then they do like a specific feature like this one and will all be about um, spelling and punctuation and Grammarly, which I'm going to show you in a second. Actually, I'm going to show you now. <laughs> so Grammarly is, is um, I've just finished a diploma. Uh, so I went back to college and I really forgot how bad my, <laughs> my grammar and spelling um, was. And this app has saved my life, helped me pass a few assignments, I'm sure. Um, and it's free. Uh, it has a premium version and a free version. Um, and basically what it does is it, it live checks your spelling and grammar, but grammar is the main thing that people use it for um, as you're typing, no matter where you are on the internet. Um, so for example, if I go to, um, let's think, let's go to medium.com. Um, sign in. Oh no, wrong thing. Um, I should have thought about this. I can't think of a website where I can actually type something in. <laughs> oh, go away, honey. Don't need you at the moment. Okay, accept all cookies. Yes, I like cookies. Um, this is a uh, grum. Oh, of course, I forgot I need to sign in. <laughs> One second. So it's a free account, you don't need to pay for it. Of course. One second, bear with me. Do I consult the Oracle on my phone for my passwords? Yada, yada, yada. Okay. So the way Grammarly works is it's, um, it will just always be present on every website that you visit. So if you go to a website that you are typing something on, whether it's filling out a form, or um, doing a job application or writing a blog entry, um, Grammarly will show up as a little uh, dot here at the moment. It's, uh, it's green, um, 
blue and yellow at the moment for the Ukraine, but it's normally green. Um, and I'll show you how it works as I'm typing in here. Um, so basically it will highlight everything with a red underline and it will tell you what the problem is. And you just need to um, click on the problem to accept their su suggestion. So here they're saying you need to add a space, you need to, so it's not just spelling, it's also the structure of your writing and, and the grammatical correctness. And what's cool is it also tells you um, how clear your writing is and whether it's interesting or not <laughs> based on certain um, things. What I would also really suggest you do is download the version for your Mac as well. So this is just within Safari as a Safari extension, but the Mac version is really cool as well. Um, so the Mac version will work whenever you have um, anything that you can write in. So if you're doing a, a Word document, for example, it will um, pop up. So if I open it on here, started course. Now the advantage of having an account with them actually is if you save words which aren't in the dictionary that you use a lot it won't it will stop trying to correct them on all the devices that you're using it on. Okay, oh goodness. So many passwords. Oh. Anyway, the same thing, <laughs> the same thing basically happens. So when you're in pages um, doing a document, you'll have a little G. Oh, here it is, it's floating here. So this is some bad grammar. The screen to show things. Well, it's it's not even letting me write anything bad at the moment. But basically, it will just basically hover around, and you can move it around so it's not in the way, um, and it will just monitor what you're doing. Oh, there's a direct message. Is it American English or English English? That is a good question. I think it takes on the dictionary that you've got active on the computer. Um, so if I sign in again, let's double check and see that's, if that's the case. Because it is an American product, so it's a good question. Yeah, here we go. So I write in British English, American English, Canadian English and Australian English. Um, and then some of the premium features, the premium features you can specify that you're writing academically or if you're writing editorially, and it will try and make your grammar and your text more fit that type of writing. But 99.9% .9 of people don't need um, that uh, kind of thing. So, so that's Grammarly, and again, not a super exciting one, but it's one I use all the time, and it does save my bacon quite a lot. My grammar is quite poor. <laughs> um, the next one is Pocket. So Pocket is a really useful little one for just saving stuff that you find on the internet, um, rather than just having an infinite list of bookmarks. Um, it's just a nice, quick, easy place to put things, and I'm going to show you two different tools to do this pockets the first the reason i've chosen two is pocket is the simpler one which is great for people that just want to save things and come and check them later and the one i'll show you after allows you to have more control over how you organize things but let's for example go to let's go to the bbc and then let's go to a story, Heinz pulls brands from shells. <laughs> so if I wanna save this story, I've already installed the pocket um, short uh, extension. So I just click on the button and then I can add a tag and you can add as many tags as you like. So I'm gonna add Heinz, news, food, whoops, food, Tesco, shortage, um, 
cost of living crisis. So that's now saved to my pocket um, account. So if I click on here, I can say open my list and it takes me to the pocket website. Um, and of course, Pocket also has apps for iPads and iPhones. And then you can see all the things that you've saved in a visual way. So it's a much nicer visual way of seeing your bookmarks. And you can create collections and organize them into collections that for different purposes. Um, what's also cool is you can also highlight things. So if I click on this, um, I can use the highlighter pen. Um, and highlight some of the the web page and then that gets added to my selection of highlights so if you're doing some research or if you need to take notes from a website it's a really cool little tool to do that um, and i can make this a favorite as well and i can change how it displays i can make it smaller text bigger text and again this is another one which has premium features but most people won't need the premium features to be honest um so that's just a nice neat way to save bookmarks is there any questions about pocket before i move to the next one and feel free to unmute if you want to ask a question too you don't have to type it if you don't want to okay cool so the next one is one called raindrop um so raindrop does pretty much the same thing um, but it gives you much, much more control over how you save things. So if I have a look, let's go to, I don't know, The Verge. And let's find something interesting that I want to bookmark. Da, da, da. I don't know, let's see anything. So this time, instead of using the pocket one, I'm going to use the raindrop one, which I've saved. Now, the cool thing about the raindrop one is it allows me to do a lot more at the time that I save the bookmark. So rather than having to just save it and then go and arrange it on pocket, I can arrange it straight away with raindrop. So I can say, I wanna put it into a folder or make a new folder. Um, I'm gonna put it in political nonsense <laughs> and add tags, trucks self-driving, oops, California. And then I can do highlights directly on the page, which is quite cool. Allow, yes. Wait for that to load. Come on, highlights. Oh, I need to download something in the background. But basically it works the same way. I would highlight a, a piece of text and it would save it with that um, link. Um, and then what's very cool is when I go to the actual raindrop um, list, um, I think you have a lot more control over kind of making folders and it's it's a bit more of a kind of, I guess slightly geekier way of organizing things and again this is completely free the only thing that you need to pay for if you want to is to get rid of the advert at the bottom which is a tiny little advert and if you want to have folders inside folders then you need to have the premium version which I think is only a couple of pounds um, but I tend to use this one more it just seems to be more powerful to me than pocket pocket's great for people that aren't bothered about organizing things and you just want to chuck it all in and save it but this one I think helps um, Kind of dig deeper into things um, and you can actually I, I find it easier to view the articles on on this service um, so that's those two any questions about raindrop so the raindrop yeah. actually oh yep is this uh, does it save all this to your computer or, or is it in the cloud it's in the cloud, yeah. So whatever apps you've downloaded, it will synchronize to. So I have it on my phone and on my iPad as well. Um, I think they even have an Apple Watch app for some reason. I don't know why. Um, but yeah, so it synchronizes it all through the cloud. So it, wow. it won't be directly on the computer, but you can download the Mac app. So if you download the Mac app, then whatever you've synchronized will stay on the computer when it's offline. 
Um, I think that might be one of the premium features as well is to save web pages offline. So you can still view them all and do things with them offline. Um, but the bookmarks will still work offline and, and be savable. And I think the other advantage is it's quite easy to um, import and export from here into other things, whereas Pocket's a bit more of a closed um, system. So I just think this one's a bit more flexible and it just has a few more advanced features, really. Right, thanks. Um, but I included both so people have a choice if they're not that bothered about um, having lots of options, then Pocket's the simpler, it's just one button. Um, whereas this one, I think, just goes a bit deeper. Any other questions about either of those two? Yes, no, good, okay. Um, right, oh, uh, someone's got a magnifying glass up at the screen. <laughs> um, so the next one is awesome screenshot. So, um, I'm sure most of you are aware you can take screenshots on your Mac and you have been able to do that for a long time. Um, but when you're taking screenshots, they're not always, um, they don't always give you as many options as you might need. So if I, for example, go to, let's go to a different website now, let's go to um, T3. Agree. Move this part out of the way. Now I'll tell you what, I'm gonna to go to my website because there's a there's a reason, <laughs> not just promoting. So with <clears throat> with awesome screenshot installed, and it's it's this square icon up the top here. If I click on it, it gives me lots of different options. So rather than just taking a screenshot, one of the cool things is I can capture the entire web page, even the stuff I can't see. So rather than having to scroll or shrink the window into the right size, I can capture the entire page and it's gonna scroll it for me and take pictures. And then it produces a large JPEG. And then what's cool about this large J JPEG is you can directly make um, notes and adjustments on it using the tools. So if you're someone that has to work on a website or work on things that are, are online, you can um, directly create notes on top of your, um, of your screenshots, which is quite cool. And then once you've saved it, where is the save done? You can then download it or you can um, send a link to somebody else just so they can see it. And it's, um, again, it's another one that's free. It's been around for a long time, actually, but it's only kind of come back again recently after disappearing for a while. Um, and then you've got a few settings that you can change it to JPEG or PNG. Um, I'm not sure how long, how long it stays available on the web version. It doesn't seem to say. Da, 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 da. Yeah. Oh, someone's got a question. Brown money web page content, it can read passwords. Um, no, it won't actually, Grammarly won't read your passwords because when you enter a password on the web, Safari doesn't grant extensions access to password fields. So Apple's very paranoid as always with security. So when you when you type in a um, password field, it, it shouldn't have any access to, to that field. So it's only in, in generic text fields that it will try and correct your grammar. But when you're typing in passwords, it won't see, it won't see what you're typing. Um, so you shouldn't have to worry too much about that. Um, Grammarly is a very big organization that's used by a lot of large institutions. So it's, it's, it's security has to be very well vetted. Um, so yeah, that's awesome screenshot. Another pretty simple one. Any questions about that one? I have one. Oh. I have a question about the long screenshot that you took. Yeah. Winds up to be a JPEG. Can it mm -hmm. be a PDF? Let's try. I think it did give an option. So when I click done. So here there's an option for save as PDF. Yes. Okay. Well, when you save it as the PDF, does that let make it keep the links that are on that 
Please? Um, no, it will just be an image, I think. But let's okay. check. I've downloaded it. So let's see. Um, Four megabytes. Yeah, so it's just it's just an image. Um, because of course it has to save as a layer on top the, the annotations that I made. Um, so it, yeah, it doesn't save it as, as a HTML linked PDF, okay. just as a flat PDF. I wonder if it, yeah, that's the only other option. Yeah, just images. Um, yeah. Okay, move on to the last one, which is Zoho Notes. So obviously Apple has their Notes um, app, which is very good and does lots of things, um, but it's not, I don't think it's the most enjoyable note experience. <laughs> um, but Zoho is the company that I use for all of my business stuff, but they actually have a couple of um, apps for, um, home use for for every everyday use that are completely free um, and notes is one of them it's a really really nice notes app um, so i'm just going to close these windows and show you and it makes taking notes off the web really simple so if i open up the notes app whoops where are you Zoho notes But yeah, I saw you. Notebook. Sorry, it's called Notebook. So Notebook's nice because I think it's just a bit more visually appealing. Um, so you can create notebooks. So if I do a new notebook, and I'll call this one, um, let's call this one Smug Stuff. And I go inside and I make a new note. What's cool is you have different um, types of notes that you can create. So you can do a voice note directly in, or you can take an image. Um, obviously, I don't have a camera attached on this computer. Um, you can do a to-do or a task list, and you can also do an attachment. So you can attach things to the notes. But if I just do an ordinary note, so this is things, oops, things to talk. Smug. And I just like that it has really nice um, features so you can edit things and this is a quote. It just goes a bit further than the Apple Notes experience and you can color code notes to have a particular meaning to you or whatever you want them to, to be. And I just like the visual way that notes are kind of seen and you can actually just scroll through and see kind of all of your notes in that way rather than just a long list and you can share the notes as well and collaborate with people but the thing that obviously the extension is for is for me to be able to save stuff directly in from the web so let me close this close this so if i go back to safari and let's go to um, mac rumors oops spelt the american way of course um fine let's do that so what i can do is i can highlight some text and then i can click on my notes here and i can say save this talk about this next time and it just goes straight into um a note and it keeps the, the links active that are in the text as well which is really cool and then the buttons at the bottom is you can actually also attach a screenshot and it will take and attach a screenshot of the whole page which is very cool um so now when i go back into my notes here and go back into my smug stuff ah oh, where did i save it to web clips nope 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 Where did it go? <laughs> it went in the smug stuff. I thought I put it in smug. Oh, I didn't say done. That's why. <laughs> um, you can also write notes on top of that as well. So if I go back into smug stuff, it should be in there now. There it is. OK. 
did it? It didn't attach. Uh, didn't attach the screenshot. I'm going to try again. Screenshot. Okay, this time it did. And again, they've just added um, annotation tools to this. So a bit like the other two that I showed you, you can also highlight um, bits of text, like a proper highlighter pen. You can say, oh, this, this is good. And this is bad. <laughs> and you can blur things out. So if you don't want people to see something, you can blur it and then save that directly into the notebook. So I think it's a much more powerful note system. Um, I've totally ditched using um, Evernote and I, I use this now instead of anything else. And it's just, I think, easy on the eyes as well. It's a very clean and straightforward interface. Um, any questions about Zoho Notes? Can I, can I ask, um, I'm sorry, I'm on a phone. Um, That's all right. If I love the color and the bold bits, and I do and manage a church website. Yep, but yep. when I, that's on Facebook, when I copy this and put it on the church website on uh, Facebook, none of the highlights or the italics or whatever of sermons, etc., register. They just come as bland Roman. Is that when you, where are you copying from? Uh, from at the moment, uh, Word and sometimes notes. Um, so that's that'll be more about when you when you copy and paste, you have the yeah. option to, um, where is it? Paste and oh no, paste and match style will match whatever you're pasting into. Um, that might just be a limitation of Facebook, actually. Okay, that's what I Yeah, because they, they probably strip out a lot of things to stop people being able to put code on, okay. on their Thank pages. You. No problem. <laughs> oh, some... Brad? Oh. Yep. With... This is Notebook from Zoho. Yes. Do you have to have a paid-for account for this? No, no, it's completely free to use. <laughs> And they have um, Android and iPhone and iPad and, and Mac versions of everything as well. Thank you. So yeah, it's completely free, and it's yeah, it's very cool. It's, I think it's one of the coolest. It's I think they've they've really tried to do something a bit different and for the, to make it look different and feel different. Um, and I just find it a bit more of a pleasure to use, to be honest. And the interface is just really nice and clean. Um, and yeah, so I, I use it for making all kinds of things, stuff that I should have done years ago. <laughs> so that's, does anyone have any general questions about extensions, just generally about what they are and, and how you use them? I'll give people a few seconds to type or not type. <laughs> um, I should just remind you that you can go into the preferences of Safari and in extensions at the top here, you've got your list of all your extensions. The only thing that might occasionally happen is when you visit some websites, some extensions like the ad blockers might make legitimate parts of websites not work. So if you go to a website and something's not working the way it should, the first thing to try is disabling your ad blocker because ad blockers, they're not super, super, um, able to determine exactly what is an ad and what isn't and sometimes websites will put marketing tools behind things which aren't ads so even like a login window might not pop up for example if you have an ad blocker installed so this would be where you can disable temporarily any of the extensions that you've got installed um, and yeah like i said you can you can go to the app store to find new ones um, one thing that that has changed recently is in the last um, developer update Apple made it so that developers can easily port um, Chrome extensions to Safari because there are a lot more extensions for Chrome and of course it means a lot of people end up using Chrome which Apple doesn't want because it's definitely not as secure as Safari um, so they've made it very easy for developers to convert their existing Chrome extensions to work with um, Safari 
So from this year on, you should start seeing an awful lot more extensions available. Um, and they should be kind of have feature parity with the same versions on Chrome. Um, so that's that about extensions. Um, Brad, can I ask a quick question? Yeah. As you've been talking, I've just gone onto the App Store and I've mm -hmm. looked up Soho, and they mm -hmm. also have um, a vault, for, uh, a yes. password vault. Would you recommend that? Um, yes, it's pretty good. Um, I'm not sure if. Um, oh yes, this one is this one because what they are they're they're actually what Zoho offers is a kind of corporate um account so yeah. Zoho is used mostly by business but I think Zoho Vault is a is able to be used by non-businesses as well so I think yeah you can use it I use this for for storing all of my client passwords um to keep them safe and it, it's fully kind of GDPR compliant and things I think it's a again a bit of a nicer simpler interface than some of the other stuff that's out there yeah thank um, you yeah, so that's, yeah, it's, it's pretty good. But the other the other apps that you see by them, most of them will be kind of very corporate, boring kind of finance things. Mm -hmm. um, but they are if you are a small business, their their invoicing software is very very powerful, and quite cheap. So it's it's um, yeah, I'd I definitely um, uh, recommend what they do. But yeah, some of it will look a bit weird and scary if you go through the list of what they what they have. But yeah, those two, I think, are available to anyone, but definitely notebooks. I've got lots of stuff. Yeah, yeah tons. <laughs> um, any other questions? Thank you. I'll move on. No problem. So the next section, so what I'll do is I'll talk about um, shortcuts and then hopefully we'll have some time at the end. And if you've got any like general questions, you can just fire them at me and I'll try my best to answer um, as many as I can. Um, so now, yeah, now I'm going to talk about shortcuts. So shortcuts um, have existed for a, a couple of years now. Shortcuts actually started life as a third party app that Apple um, saw and uh, purchased, uh, which is what Apple tends to do. <laughs> if they see some competition, they buy it. Um, <laughs> so the shortcuts app was on your phone first and then last year they added it to um, Macs um, and essentially what the shortcuts app does, do, I mean are any of you familiar with um, Automator? Have you ever heard of Automator? Hands up anyone? Wave at the camera if you've heard of Automator. Very <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> so Automator was an app and it still exists and it's still going to be around, I think, for a couple of years. Um, Automator was an app which was very powerful, but for a lot of people is a bit terrifying because you kind of need to have a slight grasp of not really programming, but you need to understand um, linguistics and the way things work in, in orders and things. But it allowed you to kind of automate processes. And, and um, so this is Automator. Um, so it's it's a bit of a learning curve. You have to really kind of dig in and understand like what all of these things end up doing and meaning. So what Apple did is they bought this competitor and fused it into Apple's system called Shortcuts, which kind of takes the place of Automator and will eventually, I'm sure, um, mean Automator will go away. And Shortcuts is a much easier, simpler way of doing things quicker um, across your Mac. Now, Shortcuts itself is probably a lot more um, useful on iOS. It's much more useful, I think, on your phone. Um, but it's very difficult to show you stuff on a phone this way remotely. Um, I might try and come up with a way of doing it soon. But So we're just showing you on the Mac for now. But almost everything that I show you on the Mac is applicable to iOS. And there are, there are tons more Shortcuts for iOS than there are for Mac. Um, so to begin with, you have the um, gallery. So the gallery tries to show you um, the most popular shortcuts and things that Apple think are going to be useful for you. And the shortcuts aren't all just made by Apple. They're also made by other people who share their shortcuts with other people. Um, so for example here, there's a shortcut to split screen Safari and notes. So you can take notes on a website. So if I add that shortcut to my list of shortcuts, I can now click on it. And it should automatically, he says, 
it should automatically open notes and open Safari. And no, it didn't. <laughs> Let me do a new note and then see. Try again. Nope, that didn't do what it's supposed to do. So this is the problem I found. It's because anybody can submit shortcuts to the gallery. They don't always work because things change quite a lot. Um, so you have to test them before you rely on them. So let's try and find another one. Um, turn text into audio. So let's add that one. So now if I go to my shortcuts. Keep. Uh, that's fine, that's fine. Run. So this is some lovely text. I want to be spoken. This is some lovely text I want to be spoken. And then I can open that in GarageBand or save it as an audio file and send it to somebody. So that's like something you can't actually do without that shortcut, without using another piece of software. Um, so shortcuts kind of allow you to do things which aren't naturally possible without a bit of kind of tweaking. Um, so I'll, I'll take you through some of the ones I've saved, which I think are quite useful. Um, Shazam is pretty cool for, for music. So I'm gonna play some music for one second. Hey Siri, play some music. What's it going to be? But if I do run Shazam, let's see. Hey Siri, stop. Okay, I've just realized it's not going to work because I'm using a monitor without a microphone. So, but basically it will just it will just identify the music and add it to your Apple Music um, playlist, which is quite cool. Um, because there isn't a direct Shazam app on the Mac, but this kind of lets you do that straight away. This next one's really interesting. Let's get carry out. It's an American one, of course. But what's really cool is when I run it, it asks me what type of food do I feel like? So I'm going to say um, Peruvian chicken. I didn't know that was a thing. Um, <laughs> let's say Chinese. And I say done. It's now going to open maps and find the nearest Chinese um, restaurants. And then when I click on there, it will call them. Um, obviously, I haven't set up FaceTime because I didn't want to accidentally call any Chinese restaurants. Um, <laughs> but it, it's it's basically taking five or six steps um, and doing them all in one click rather than you having to do five or six different clicks. Another one I've added here is time tracking. So this one's quite useful. Um, so inside the shortcut, and I can go, this is what's inside the shortcuts. You don't need to understand all of this to use shortcuts. You can just take them off the gallery and use them. You don't need to understand what's going on here. Um, but for example, in this shortcut, I need to be able to add an extra project. So I'm gonna add a new project and call it smug, um, smug demo project timer. So now when I go back, Oh, how do I even go back? What, why am I being such an idiot? <laughs> yeah. um, now when I run it, it's going to say, what project are you working on? So I'm going to say this one. Um, when did I start working on it? So I'm going to say about, well, it was 1930. And I've spent 45 minutes. This was fun. <laughs> and it just automatically takes all that data and adds it into notes as a data log for uh, an activity or a task that you're doing. So you can have as many uh, projects as you want set up in that little shortcut. And it's just a useful way of kind of automating a process that you do over and over and over again. 
Um, another one is, let's have a look, Shakespeare insult generator. <laughs> so I click play. Thou bootless guts griping coxcomb. Yeah. I mean, that's a completely pointless one. <laughs> but it's just the crazy sorts of things that you've got here. Like well, reflect on day is another good one. So reflect on day will just ask me some questions. Like, how do I feel today? Okay. Um, lovely sunny day and fish and chips. So for people that like to keep a reflective journal, it's pretty cool. How to make a shortcut. What did you do well? I paid off my credit card. <laughs> I didn't. Uh, what do I need to do off tomorrow? Um, go to work. <laughs> Who can you help tomorrow? My mum. And then again, that's created a nice little organised um, note that looks nice and neat and tidy. And it has my kind of uh, daily journal entry in a nice, neat, uniform way that will always be the same. Um, another, here's one that I'm not going to press because <laughs> it will end everything, but it's quite a useful thing that your app doesn't have, your Mac doesn't have a way to just quit all the apps that are open. Um, there isn't an, a normal way to do that. So this is just a shortcut that allows you to just close everything um, without closing down the Mac. You can just close all the apps all at once rather than doing force quit or going through them one by one and quitting them. You can just hit this shortcut and it will quit all of the apps for you. But I won't do that because that will end our thing right now. <laughs> um, another one, this one is quite useful. This is a passwords one. Um, so I don't know if you know, but whenever you save a password in Safari, it goes into a place called your keychain. On your keychain, you can access using an app called Keychain Access, but that app is buried quite deep in your applications folder in another folder called Utilities. And it's a bit of a pain to kind of go in and out all the time. So most people don't bother. But this app, when I run it, it just takes me straight into the passwords in Safari without having to um, go through all the clicks to get there. So it's just a really simple one that just does something really neat and tidy. Um, so those are things that you can find in the gallery and there's there's things for all kinds of things that you can imagine toothbrush timers logging caffeine um, adding stuff to your um, for example there's ones for adding food entries to your health records in the health app you're logging your weight that kind of thing um, you can have reminders that that trigger when you arrive or leave somewhere all sorts of things um, this one's quite useful so if you're playing a song in apple music you can hit this button and it will then play the rest of that album that that song is from rather than you having to hunt for the album or go searching for the artist you can just go straight to the album that the song the current song playing is from um, that saves quite a bit of time so you can see that there's lots and lots of categories there's tons um, and then apple up here has created some some kind of lists of ones which they think are very good to start with um, so those are kind of the pre-made Shortcuts. Are there any questions about those about the gallery? It it mentions something. Um, if you go back, it about putting something in to a diary. Is that the same as the calendar app, or is that something separate? That would probably be. Um, I'm trying to see which one you're talking about. I'm not seeing it. Uh, there it is. Say, oh, here, put in your diary. diary. So, Oh, that's just a category. So each one of these shortcuts will do something completely different. Um, okay. So the category is to do with diarising things. Um, so for example, this one here is email a schedule to yourself. So if you run this shortcut, it will look into your calendar and then send an email with a list of all of those things to somebody or to yourself. Um, so that's quite a useful one. But you have to go into each shortcut to actually see exactly what it does. Um, so if I go back down, estimate travel time to meeting, that's another useful one. See how long it will take to get to any meeting that includes a location. Um, so you do have to kind of go in and out to kind of understand what it's trying to do for you. Um, yeah, any other questions about those? No? 
Um, so I'll show you now how to make a really basic one from scratch. So those are all pre-made um, uh, shortcuts, but you can just make them from scratch. So I'm going to click on plus at the top, and then this brings us the builder window. Now, what's good about the builder window compared to the old automator is it tries to suggest um, what you might want to make based on what you use all the time. Um, so everybody's window will look different. It will be based on what, what things you tend to do a lot. Um, so it's trying to suggest uh, what type of shortcuts you might want to make. But I'm going to make a really basic one. So I'm going to look for location. So I want this shortcut to get my current location. And I want it to be as accurate as possible. And then once it's got that location, I want it to message somebody. So I'm going to send add the send message after. And it's going to send the current location. And then I click inside there and I can say, this is where I am. Come and meet me. And then I can say two, and then I'm going to say to my kitty cat. <laughs> so you can add a loved one, or you can add a partner, or something. If it's something you do all the time, like um, this is where I am, I'm in this shop, or whatever. Um, and then I'm going to say that I want this to be in my menu bar at the top. So obviously, on your Mac, you don't have as many options as you do on your phone. On your phone, you can actually save a shortcut as an app icon that you can just quickly tap on. And you can also save them into widgets quite easily and you can save them in lots of different places. On the Mac, there's only a couple of places you can save them and that's pinned in the menu bar. So pinned in the menu bar is up here. And then I've saved some of the shortcuts that I use a lot. Um, or you can add them in a services menu. And the services menu is when you right click on something, you have uh, quick actions and services. So you can add them to these two menus. So it's not quite as intuitive as it is on the phone or an iPad, um, but still useful. So now I can I can run this. It's not going to work because I haven't connected my uh, messages account. But basically, it will then just send somebody. Um, yeah, I haven't configured my messages. It will just send the person that I've um, chosen my location. So it's just a case of like diving through the contents of all the things that you, you've got installed and what you can do with them and then combining them. So for example, if I do another one, I delete these. We can do see what options photos has. So we could say get the last get the latest select photos. Let's do find photos. Sort by date taken. Add filter. Album is let's say long exposure and then we can say email and then we want to so it's basically you're creating these flows from of actions what you want to happen with just one click so i'm going to say send an email to this one And I can add multiples if I need to. Um, and you just basically work by just searching for this, the, the action that you want to take. So suggestions um, shows you the most common things that you might want to do. Um, and that's the good place to start because it, it really narrows it down to the most useful, most simple um, actions that you can take. But if you go to all actions, it shows you there are actually thousands of things that you can command it to do. Um, there's so many, many things and you can get lost in here looking for, for ages for things, but it does also help you um, split it by category. And then you can also, if there's an action that you use in things quite a lot, you can add it to your favorites. Um, so if I click here, I can add that as a favorite so I can always go back to it easily if I use it in lots of different shortcuts. So that's the, the action categories. And then you can look by the apps that you have installed as well. So you can you can just go to a specific app and then it will show you all the all the actions that are available for that app. Um, so it's basically about combining all of these uh, steps into one clickable button, if you like. Um, so that's basically what shortcuts are.
Any more questions on shortcuts? Anyone? Can't see everyone. Let me try and change the. All good. So we still have some time. I have a question uh, about uh, yeah? shortcuts. Are there yeah, any sure. YouTube videos that that will train us to kind of do the scripting kind of thing itself in shortcuts? Yeah, so this, this, it does get quite complicated. The Apple website is actually really good. They have a special page. Um, I'll show you the address. The, the shortcuts, shortcuts user guide. Um, and then they have um, deeper kind of tutorials about creating automations and using scripting. So it is actually pretty good documentation that they have. Um, but there are loads of videos on YouTube as well, um, free videos. And I think there's a couple of courses even. Um, I did also find some websites. Let me go back to my keynote presentation. So there's a website called Routine Hub. And this is more for iOS, but it's still shortcuts. Um, so Routine Hub has loads of um, suggestions about what to do with shortcuts. And it does it really nicely into, into these categories. So we can say, oops, we can say, okay, let's do something around finance. So it just has loads and loads of things that other people have made and wanted to share easily. And they kind of tell you exactly what they do. So if I download one to show you how easy it is, um, let's get, might struggle finding one that will actually work. Let's try this one. I don't know what this one is. Create your personal titanium Apple card. <laughs> okay, get a shortcut. And it just instantly adds it to your shortcuts app. Uh, da, 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 da. Is this gonna do anything? I don't think that's valid in the UK anyway, actually. Apple card run. I think it's just creating a fake Apple card for me. <laughs> yeah, no, it's not going to work because it's from the US. Um, but it's, yeah, it's just a really cool website that has thousands of different things that people have already made. So if you're not too um, confident about making something from scratch, it's almost certain that somebody else has already made something that you're trying to do. And it's just a case of going through these categories and finding all the little shortcuts that people have created. Oh, here you go, let's try this network tool one. This one should work, a shortcut. Add shortcut, and we'll use yes. Fast.com is a good website to use. So now, when I run network tool, I uh, what do I want to do? I want it to do a speed test. So I say done, and it's now going to quickly do a speed test. Or I can try a different thing. I can ask it to share my Wi-Fi via QR code with somebody if I didn't want to give them my password. Or I could do a ping. So there's lots of kind of crazy little features that you can unlock, which you couldn't normally do. Um, oh, hang on, not cheap, but David's tutorial is going to stuff very thoroughly. Max Sparky, let's have a look field guide yeah i mean it is it is a pretty huge area so when people are making content for it it's going to take them a lot of time um so that's not too bad actually if it if it goes into it in detail um but yeah it is something that you can you can automate everything um and save some time <laughs> yeah okay so um 
now I guess we can have some time for just general questions if you like. So feel free to let me know if you've got any questions about all things, Mac, iPhone, anything. If anybody's got any questions, please feel free to unmute. You don't have to do it by the chat at this time. Yeah, it'll probably take a bit too long to type everything. You can all unmute now if you want. But don't all ask at once. <laughs> yeah. Can I ask, please? Um, you may. I, I have quite serious deafness and hearing problems. Um, right. And I also find quite a lot of this really overwhelming. Um, I just found from out from Select the other day, you know, it used to be Stormfront and now it's Select as, as the Apple franchise. Um, they yeah. have cancelled their face-to-face -face training classes, which I used to find so helpful. And yeah. they now have two options, which they've, they've let me take. Um, on how to understand what your iPhone can do and how to understand what your what your laptop can do. Is is there anything really basic and simple that for this kind of, of understanding these features? Because to me, otherwise it's just so overwhelming that I won't do any of it. Yeah. No, I understand. Um, what's really sad is the Apple stores used to have a really good training as well which they, they don't do anymore they have general presentations but they're not really that um helpful for specific issues and things that people want there is training um there is well there's linkedin training for 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 one um let me find it linkedin training which used to be called linda linda.com um and microsoft bought it and even though it's Microsoft, they do still have um, training for Mac things. So um, let me just have a look, see if, see if they definitely do still. Oh, I don't even let you search for the classes. That's helpful. Lynda.com. Yeah. It was Lynda.com, yeah. And then, then LinkedIn bought it. Is it still working as Lynda.com? No, they've, they've changed it. So now if we search for Mac, there we go. So essential training, four hours, um, computer literacy for Mac, that would be a nice basic one. And of course, it being a video means you can um, obviously use any aids that you need to use and have it at full volume. Um, but obviously, that is video based learning. So it's not going to be somebody guiding you. It's going to be um, going at your own pace with the video. And some of them will have um, activities for you to follow along and do on your Mac. Um, I haven't used it since it became LinkedIn, but when it was Linda, it was very, very good. And it was the, the platform that Apple used directly with Apple employees to train them. So um, it, there's a lot of good content on there. And you can see there's 16,665 results for Mac. <laughs> <laughs> I'll keep you busy. <laughs> but, um, I, I, one, one. Please. Yeah. <laughs> I would say start with the essentials one. Okay. Essential training and the computer literacy one, probably for the basics. And then you've got quick tips. And then these ones will be useful when it's about specific upgrades, like Big Sur is the most recent one. So that might be useful as well to just get up to date with what's new on the most recent one. Um, I'm not sure how much it costs. Let's have a look. So monthly, it's about £30 a month. Um, but you could be sneaky and just do the one month trial and then try and cram in as much as you can and then cancel it. <laughs> Right. Um, but yeah, it's. I think it's about the same price that it was when it was Linda, actually. Um, but I think you don't have to. There's no contract. I think you can you can end whenever you want to. Um, so if you just feel like you want to do a month of intense training, you can you can do that. But they have training, I think, in lots of things, not just um, tech stuff. They have trainings in all sorts of areas. Um, but yeah, that's probably the, the best place to go for kind of self-paced training. There's also the, um, the ones which I used to find useful, I don't know if they still are that useful, were the dummies guides. Yeah, um, they used to be very good. The, the other ones were the missing manuals guides. Yes, yeah, the missing manuals were huge. They were enormous. <laughs> um, but these are, these are written in really plain English um, and they're, they're laid out in such a way that um, they really break that stuff down to make it really easy to digest and not too difficult. Um, 
so I would suggest if you're more of a book person then this range of books the dummies and the yeah the missing manual used to always be the big ones uh, I think the missing manual is more complete it covers more but it's a bit more technical than the dummies guides um yeah hope that okay, helps thank you that's great you're welcome is a, a very general character personality question yeah well uh you're in Tucson but are you English or American because you speak in, in uh, you know spoke, uh, I mean you receive English rather than American English <laughs> I'm, I'm English I'm, totally I'm in confused. London right now <laughs> I'm in London <laughs> Oh, okay. yes. <laughs> <laughs> Although I would probably rather be in Florida or somewhere. <laughs> Any other questions? Everybody's muted. Anything general? Wow, this is the this is a first. <laughs> normally fighting people up oh hello mike hello i'm back <laughs> hi nobody wants to talk can you believe it <laughs> you've stunned them into silence <laughs> <laughs> this has Fred, never happened before Fred, it's nigel can i ask a question about yeah, key chain something yeah, i've sure. come across a few times lately is when i'm going on to a site and have to put in a password it says you know you've got to have something with eight letters or eight yeah. digits or 15 digits or something and I can't find a way in Keychain to force it to generate um, a password that I can use. Some sites are great. Yeah. It gets to, to, you know, it, it makes mm. the uh, password up and it happens. But if I need to force it to, I can't find a way of doing it. Yeah, there isn't at the moment, but I think mm. it is coming in the next OS. I think they are, they are allowing you to create um, rules for password, auto password filling. Right. Um, so I think that's coming in the next version, which should be in September, and you'll be able to, to add different um, password schemes to the keychain settings for it to, because to, of course, yeah, some websites have very specific requirements, like some will ask for two non-alphanumeric characters or something like that. So yeah, at the moment, it's, it's you're kind of stuck with whatever they suggest. Um, and of course, the temptation is to use the same old password. Yeah, well, my, my method, I'll let you all into my secret and I, I'll give it for free, <laughs> is um, I have the same password, but it's always different. And that sounds like it's impossible, but <laughs> the, what, the way I do it is I start with a word and it can be anything. So let's say the word is zebra and that first word will be uppercase. So I'll have an uppercase zebra. Then the next word will be lowercase and it's the thing that I'm signing into. So it will be Amazon, for example. And then after that, I'll have a number, which is always the same. So let's say 10. And then I'll have a punctuation mark. So like a comma or let's, let's say exclamation mark. So a zebra and the number 10 and an exclamation mark, those always stay the same. The bit in the middle is always different because it's the thing that you're signing into. And because it's the thing that you're signing into, you can't forget what, what it is because you know what you're trying to sign into. So that way, every time you sign into something, it will always have a different password technically, but you've got a password regime in your head where you know, actually, yes, my password's actually all the same, but the only bit that changes is the thing that I'm trying to sign into. So it's, it's a way of having one password, but actually it is different for every single thing that you sign into. Um, and that's, that's made my life a lot easier because I have a lot of passwords to keep on top of. Can I stick an oar in? Yeah, stick to it. <laughs> yeah, so this this password business is something that crops up all the time, not just with our yeah. group, but with every group that I attend. And um, I picked up a hint, which I've, 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 I've used ever since, and that is to use the first letters of the first lines of a favourite song or book. Yes. And to give, to give you an example... To give you an example, I've just written this down because I, I can't obviously remember it, but 
Uh, yeah, <laughs> A A S D I M H T A V M B F is about as random as you could get. But, <laughs> but but those are the those those are the first letters of every word of the first two lines of one of my very most favourite songs, and and that's kind of worked for me. Um, yeah, and, no and, one's and, ever going to know that. No, no absolutely, one's, no one's ever um, going to know it, are they? And also staring at the screen we're looking at at the moment. Um, um, a, a tiny, tiny uh, Mac user group that I visit in Arizona depends on David Pogue and his missing manuals. Yeah. And I understand from them that unfortunately he's been given the boot. So there won't be any oh, more. Oh God. Which is a real shame. Wow, that's, that's crazy. Like, that's, that's like 20 years of Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Well, hopefully he carries on making them, but for someone else. <laughs> yeah, hope so. Because I'm sure it's probably a big part of his life. Mm, that's sad. Well, um, by the number of them, it probably is his life. Isn't yeah, it? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I wonder if it's just a, the general decline of books full stop, and yeah. maybe they're trying to push into digital or something. And um, But yeah, obviously a lot of people still prefer to use a book than... Um, following videos and things. Uh, yeah. Any other? Oh, a technical correspondent, isn't he? Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, and he's quite a, a fun person. Actually, he's quite easy to listen to, and he's very uh, energetic about Mac stuff. He's very. He's a yeah. proper Apple um, geek, and has loved it from day one. So his his um, energy was always quite ca um, contagious. Um, oh, you got a password generator. Someone's posted to the links. What's this? Oh my goodness, <laughs> that's hardcore, isn't it? <laughs> oh crikey! So, so you... when is Max stock? <clears throat> what? Sorry. When is Max stock? What's Max stock? I don't know what that is. Oh, I'm sorry. That's an American <laughs> thing, I guess. Oh, the, what is it like a a convention of sorts? Yes, it's like the uh, Amiga world used to be, or uh, uh, oh. Mac world used to be. Yeah, no, we don't have anything like that over here. But this looks like some terrifying English exam. It does. <laughs> that, that <laughs> I'm going to fail. <laughs> but what's cool is it's got presets, though. So it's got a preset for the Apple ID re requirements. Generate three passwords. Oh, goodness. There we go. 24 master almost entered 87 <laughs> um yeah so that's if you want to be really serious about it and um be unhackable <laughs> any other generic stuff questions things issues concerns can i just ask this is all becoming so complicated where do you see things going for the future do you what? think iPhones are just going to get more and more and more complicated or, 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 or what? Um, well, I think the opposite is true, actually. I think they're getting more and more simple. Um, they're definitely easier than they were 10 years ago. Um, it's getting simpler in terms of everything's kind of becoming the same. So especially with the latest Mac OS that's coming out in September, the iPad and the Mac will be almost identical in many ways. and the phone will also have a lot of the same features. So it's it's actually, I think, becoming simpler um, because at, at some point there won't, won't be any distinction between one device or another. It will be the same things everywhere. Um, it's already the case for apps. So there's now universal apps. So when you download an app, some of the apps are then um, available on your Mac and your iPad as well. Um, so more and more stuff is is kind of converging. So I think it will it will get simpler. It will get simpler. I mean, there's less, I think there's less new features to be had. They're, they're kind of struggling, I think, with each new device to try and think of something to sell it um, because they've got to a point now where they've kind of really perfected a lot of things or um, added as many features as could possibly added, short of kind of adding a coffee machine or something to the back of an iPhone. I don't know <laughs> what else they can do other than just improving the camera each year, which is what they seem to do. Yeah, that would be nice, wouldn't it? A nice Nespresso pod. I think it's all gonna. I think it's all gonna evolve into AI. Well, I mean, I think the thing that's really happening is Apple is pushing 
deep and they're spending a lot of money into AR. So a AI is that Apple already, um, Apple already heavily uses artificial intelligence for things like Siri and for um, the deep learning that they need for a lot of the kind of clever stuff that happens. Um, but augmented reality is what Apple are betting on. So Facebook and Google, they really believe in this metaverse thing where we're all, we're all going to exist as avatars or little cartoons in this make-believe land of rainbows and unicorns. Um, but that I, I don't, just don't buy into that. I don't think it, it's mm. been tried so many times and it's failed so many times. Well, I agree um, because it's, you're basically hijacking my brain. Yeah, and, and you're, you're offloading everything to an imaginary space. And Correct. It, it, just, it just creates another barrier. But Apple's um, angle is that they're putting all of their bet on augmented reality, which will mean at some point they'll come out with a pair of glasses which will overlay information on the actual world rather than creating a virtual world that we all inside. It will overlay information as you're walking about the streets and as you're doing things in your day-to-day -day life, stuff will just automatically happen. And you'll see like closing times of a shop as you walk past it and that kind of thing. Um, and I think that's a much more sensible, more realistic thing. I, I don't know if any of you have seen it, but the, the meta stuff looks so childish and so um, juvenile. I just, I just couldn't begin to have a meeting with somebody in the metaverse. It would just, no, I don't want to be a badger having a meeting. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think that's where it's going. Um, and I think in the short term, we're probably getting very close now to cloud computing for Apple. So eventually I think what chips each device has and how fast the processes are will start becoming irrelevant because more and more stuff will be done on Apple servers um, and more and more computing will be done remotely and the devices that we have will just be access terminals. So eventually, and that will help solve the battery issues that we all have because they, they won't need to be hardcore computing done on a device, it'll all be done remotely. So I think that's the future. I think iPhones are actually gonna end up becoming just access terminals and Macs too at some point. You already have lots of services which are done online um, without you even knowing it. A lot of stuff that's done in Photoshop is actually done on a server. Um, so it's, yeah, it's that's the way we're going. And I think I'm optimistic. I think it will all be better and easier and require less fiddling and trying to get stuff to work that isn't working. And I think it's a, a good thing. But the rumors are that, that there's Could gonna be a big that... event in January. Sorry, I just say sorry. that it's uh, the the problem is if you live somewhere where you don't get any uh, internet. Yes, yes. <laughs> well, I mean, we're of of most of the modern world, we're really lagging behind in the UK um, with connection. Um, most of Europe has really upgraded everything, and and most people in in most parts, even very poor parts of Europe, have really good connections. So uh, Elon, just... Elon Musk. Didn't Elon Musk create a satellite internet? Yeah, so Starlink. Um, Starlink's just um, launched in the UK, actually. So Starlink, for about 70 quid a month, gives you a, a satellite connection, which is very stable. Um, you do need a clear line of sight to the sky, so it doesn't work if you don't have access to a sky line of sorts. Um, but Starlink is, is really a really good option for people that live somewhere that's just really too far from a telephone exchange and if you need the internet of course it's twice the price of normal broadband but it's just this little thing that looks like a school table <laughs> but it's very small it's not as big as it looks it's very small and it's just something you you chuck in the garden and it will give you a, a solid internet connection hmm. um so that's what what he, kind um, of what kind of speed does it have so at the moment i think it's about 150 megabits um, both, both ways or just one way? Because no, the earlier satellite way. systems were one way. Yeah. The second going up again was very, very slow. Yeah, it's it's definitely a lot faster than traditional satellite um, methods. Just trying to find where does it actually say the speed. Um, uh, they're fine yeah, to tell you. Traditional satellites are also very, very expensive, and you pay per megabit. Um, all of Starlink is completely un um, unlimited. There's no limits on how much data it's also low latency so it's good for people who play games and things 
where is it? It doesn't actually say the speed. That's not very helpful, is that's it? Frightening. <laughs> well, if it doesn't speed say, it's slow. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, the, the, the other the other thing is it's something that's growing. So they're having basically to get the license that they had. They had to promise the European Space Agency that they would have a hundred thousand satellites within ten years. So they're having to launch thousands of satellites every month. And so with every launch of satellite, it massively improves the speed and the coverage. So it's something that's only going to increase and get more and more fast and, and more and more available. Um, so at the moment, they're saying da, 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 it's around 65 to 90 megabits per second for download. Doesn't say much about upload. Why is it saying upload? Doesn't really say much. Um, but it is a game changer if you live in an area which is completely cut off from good internet. And it's very, yeah. very, I think the only, the only downside is it can be affected by storms. So if you have a really bad storm, it can affect it. Yeah, even um, just, he just heavy rain will affect it as well. All oh, right, okay, yeah. I don't so want to make it... Elon Musk any richer. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, we, no, none of us need to do anything to make him richer. Once you've got to a certain level of wealth, it just makes itself, yeah. doesn't it? <laughs> Right, I, I um, don't mind if he's richer and he can buy China. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very different kind of rich. <laughs> um, but no, I mean, he, he donated loads of these to the Ukraine. So they're, they're dotted all over the Ukraine at the moment and giving them free internet. So mm -hmm. um, he's not a great person, but he has moments of <laughs> small, very small moments of humanity. Um, but yeah, that is an option now to the UK. It was in America to begin with and not here, but now it is in the UK. So it's something it's worth maybe just contacting them and seeing if it's good for you. Yeah. Um, they can they well, can give you an idea in, in your location about what kind of speed you should achieve um, and whether you're going to have full coverage or not. Um, but yeah, you're more likely I to get that than you are any help from the government in terms of speed increases. 